Tim May in Deep River Woman. That is a classic intro. So good to have you here today Thanks and you, uh, talking about your amazing career with not only the great Lionel Richie, but uh, we're going to go through a lot of your career, some of the hit songs that you played on that we've heard on the radio that okay. maybe was uh, even you know scored some people's weddings. This is their first dance yeah. song in some cases. There's just so many amazing songs that you've been on. I'm just, I'm just uh, so grateful to have you here at Igloo in Burbank and just uh, taking us through memory lane with uh, some of these amazing songs. So uh, let's talk about Deep River Woman since we started there sure. and get into maybe some of the details that uh, you can walk us through about gear, the sessions, and so forth. Absolutely. Right. This was the guitar that was used. This was it. This the Valley it. Arts. Yeah. And you, so you said that, that you did 50 different variations of that intro. Well, the, when we did the date, there was nothing written. And, you know, the, we had chord, ch chord changes for the tune. And, you know, like, I was, hey, play a little intro or something, you know. So I probably played a, you know, just off the top of my head because, you know, I said, okay, I you know, didn't have too much time to put thought into it, which is sometimes good, you know, yeah. you have the spontaneity. But, uh, yeah, I played a few different ones, and that seemed to be the one that made the record for some reason. <laughs> For, I mean, you were kind of the guy for Lionel Richie for his string of like just huge records for pretty much spanning a decade. Oh, wow. uh, and I always just love that sound. I, I always assumed it was some sort of strat. I had no idea that it was a Valley Arts, although I guess it should have made sense given the time. Every right. session guy uh, of, of a certain level, especially that of yours, was using Valley Arts. Yeah, Mike was making guitars for everybody. What was like? What was the story behind this particular guitar? This was used on other Lionel Richie sessions, I presume, as well. Oh yeah, this was used on. This was my main strat for all that era, you know. And we'll get more into those particular songs, but just tell us about this guitar, just so we kind of know. Well, Mike McGuire at Valley Arts back in the day when they were on Ventura Boulevard uh, put this together for me. He was making them, and this is number twenty-five wow. that he's made. It says on the back there, and uh, I just said, Mike, go. You know, he made. Uh, his his things that he wanted and he put the very hard maple neck nice ebony fingerboard and it's rosewood like we we're talking about the yeah rosewood rose. body yeah which makes it heavy but you know it's it's manageable and it's just a turned out to be a great guitar it's i have a theory about guitars that you can get all the best ingredients you can think of and put them together but if they don't really work together it doesn't work and you can yeah. get some marginal inexpensive guitars that just sync together all the, the neck and the body the woods and yeah. the whole thing I might be all wrong about that, but it seems no. like that's how they interact, you know. I mean, you're you're taking dissimilar species of woods that come from potentially different continents, and you're gluing them together, yeah. and it's it can be like swinging at a pinata, you know. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, that's one of the reasons why, especially, uh, it's apparent with acoustic guitars. It seems you play five of the same exact guitar, and they're going to be five different guitars. Absolutely, There's similarities, but you know, that's. That's the nature of the guitar. Did, but yeah, Mike made this. Did you have a lot of influence over like what he put? Like, did you say, I want EMGs, I want a mid boost, I want the ebony board and the rosewood body and the the bird's eye maple neck? Or was you know, it... I think I left a lot of that to him. We he kind of knew what I wanted. I didn't want anything unusual, and it was pretty much a common thing. The mid range boost, um, we probably spoke about that. Yeah, because that's good just to get a little more hitting the amp a little harder. and yep. getting that thing. Um, especially with a you know just a single coil EMG, yeah. so that beefs that up. Um, and then of course the Floyd was a big thing when they first the very first guitars that he made, um, they didn't have the tuning. Uh, oh, like, oh, like the little micro tuners. Yeah. Kind of, yeah, and it was oh it was brutal because you get the guitar nice and tuned and you crank these up, and then it twists everything so yeah. uh, these go flat, this goes sharp, and and then you got to really compensate when I'm tuning this string because I know I'm going to tune this, you know, and it was yeah. a real challenge. Then this came in shortly after and saved all that. You know? Yeah, yeah, well, everybody seemed to use these, and it, it seems like all, when we were talking with Paul Jackson, uh, he has a Rosewood Strat, really heavy one from yeah. Valley Arts. It seemed like people weren't afraid of the heavy Strats back in the 80s. No, no, I didn't even think about it, to be honest with you. Yeah. I mean, it was just, 
I, the weight didn't even occur to me so right. much, but I knew it wasn't going to be ridiculous. It turns out to be a real hit maker after all. It was a great guitar. Yeah, it is a great guitar, I should say. Yeah. So this was the guitar that was used on Deep River Woman. What about for amps? Do you remember anything about what you used for that? You know, I've had so many, well, you know, half a dozen different rigs. I think at that time, there's a good chance I was using a couple of Fender, the the newer ones that they made in that are with the blackface um Deluxe and the Vibralux, I think. Uh -huh. And and they made Paul Rivera probably modded them up a little bit for me. And uh and my gosh, I can't remember I think the pedal board I had was one of the first ones Paul Rivera made for me. Mm -hmm. Which had a Mutron biphase. It kinda <laughs> built along the side of the chair. Uh -huh. And and I had all my foot stuff here, and then the biphase, and it, it was a cool little board, and all the buffers and stuff like that. So. Yeah, yeah, he was the the godfather of the pedal board at yeah, the time. Yeah, but it was that. I probably had the original chorus, the Roland, the CE one. one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, you suspect yeah. that was what was on that intro originally for the most likely for Deep River Woman. Most likely, yeah. yeah. But I guess I can't be sure, but I'm pretty sure that's that's probably what it would have been. Yeah, so. yeah. It's an. I mean, that that clean tone on there is is always amazing, and it sounds yeah you know, super stratty, beautiful cleans, and then all of the all of like the fills that you do in it are also just like really gorgeous. The tone works really good with the track and with Lionel's piano and stuff. Uh, and he was playing the piano on it. Yeah, yeah. That's he, him. He played it, and the good thing about um, rec recording with Lionel is he would. Most often, almost always sing the song while we were tracking. Really? At least in the beginning, maybe not every single time, but for the most part. And that, boy, that was the whole thing, because so many times you go in and do a record and you don't really have an idea of what you're backing up. Yeah. You know, they, well, we're going to put the vocal on later, and, you know, it, it, it works, you deal with it, and, and but it's there's nothing like hearing the real vocal, so you get a complete thing of of what you're accompanying. You know, and was he in the room with you? Was that done live, or did yeah. he... Yeah, a lot of those we did it, yeah, that was, we did it a and M. I I think it was... Um, uh, let's see, maybe Paul Lyme may have been on drums. Uh, who would have been on bass? I forgot who else was on the session, actually. But, yeah, we did, did him live, and Lionel would then be in there playing really? and singing with us, yeah. I don't, I'm not sure if he kept his, what he performed at the right. You know, he just played Rhodes or sometimes piano. But, yeah, we did him live. Those so he was a legit good. musician. I mean, he could really play. Oh, yeah, him. he yeah. was good. You know, yeah, he, he was a legit musician, a learned musician, but he had the intuitive... Part yeah. two. You could learn all you want, but if you don't have that yeah. musical instinct, it doesn't mean much. That's know? incredible. I had no idea. I had no idea. I kind of just, yeah. I mean, so many guys in that era were just kind of like the voice, but everything was written for them. Of course, right. that wasn't the case for Lionel Richie. That's right. I want to go now to another huge song that we all know, uh, the song Hello. And uh, can you tell us anything about what, what happened on that session, that song? Well, that was um, pretty straight ahead. Uh, Typical Lionel and Richie session, which was very well run, and but Lionel made everybody very comfortable, and very professional, you know. But he was the coolest, you know, is the coolest. But it was, it was nice, and that was. I remember I played acoustic guitar. I yeah, my Martin D eighteen on that. Uh -huh. It's about a sixty one D eighteen. Because you're doing those like really nice arpeggios. And yeah, stuff like that. and just just some uh, the kind of just finger picking things like that, and uh, yeah, it was. I remember we we. Played it several times, and the, the trick, not the trick, but the thing, because Lionel always played piano when he played, and the thing that I always tried to do was play stuff that complemented his piano playing and, f and fit, you know, the right mm -hmm. way. And a lot of it is, well, like like playing on anybody else's material, it's not about, man, what a great guitar player, what a hot, you know, it's about supporting the song. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sometimes the, the best thing that you could do for the song is not the most fiery, rippy kind of guitar hero thing. You know? mm -hmm. But that was Hello. It was a very nice thing. The whole key with that was just playing in time and locking in the... Yeah. With, with, I think Paul Lyon was playing drums. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was it was a nice date. And did you play the solo on that as well? That was Louis Shelton. That was Louis Shelton. Louis overdubbed that, yeah. Uh, it sounded great, too. Were you there when he did the solo? No, no, no. Right. I wasn't. That was one of the overdubs. No, I wasn't there. Um, Nice track, though. No question about it. Do you remember anything about, like, uh, like when, when you, with your Martin, do you remember anything about, like, did you have, like, a mic compliment that you would often use when you were doing this sort of stuff as far as, like, getting the, the right acoustic tone for that? Well, you know, I always would, would go to the date and, and do everything I could with whatever the best guitar that I thought was appropriate, and then I'd let the engineer do his thing. Okay. And Unless there was 
something I objected to. I always deferred to how he wanted to mic it and so right. on. And then if you know, we could discuss whatever tweaks we may want to make. But I kind of deferred to the engineer, and, and you know, and a lot. Of, it's it's funny. A lot of times they would come and you know, some three or four different mics all over yeah. there, bobbing their head all over the place and stuff like that. But then other guys would just put one mic and into the best mic and mm. whatever was appropriate for the guitar and just dial it in the right way and it's perfect. Do you remember where that was recorded? Yeah, I think that was at A&M Studios. Okay. And was there like a uh, a big chart for that or was it kind of just like a... Chord chart. M most of Lionel's things were strictly chord symbols, you know, uh. bar, bar chart with uh, the changes written out. And then maybe some little uh, little particular thing, might, if something go... Some thing ensemble where everybody kind of plays a little uh, part of the bar or into the next section or something. Yeah, those may be written out, but it's pretty much chord symbols. That yeah. one was deeper for women. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm saying like I could hear it right away. Like it's like an iconic like uh, yeah, that, yeah, walk yeah. up, right? Right, right. Yeah, you got a lot yeah. of those in that song. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, uh, I love that one. Uh, so on on hello, he was he had his chord charts and would you did he tell you like i want this strummed i want this picked i want arpeggios here or did would that be no, all left to you lionel was was smart and and great that way because he would pretty much let everybody he hired the players for their expertise yeah and the first you know i'm not going to hire a plumber and then tell him what to do you know I, he'd <laughs> let everybody do and then he would you know, you know, the producer james carmichael and different people would maybe suggest you know and tweak as the as we the takes were going on and playing but he he let a lot of freedom with yeah. Lionel, which was nice, you know. Yeah. Um, like I said, he, he, that's that's smart too. Because yeah. You hire the best players to and let them do it. The know? proof is in the pudding. I mean, like so many of those are there's just hugely successful records. He's done like, okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Uh, Tim, would you be willing to play any kind of? I know it's you're not playing a D18, but would right. you kind of be willing to play maybe some of like the little parts that you developed during the arpeggios for Hello? Yeah, I just, you know, like. Like it was that kind of a thing, yeah. You know, and then and then it got into some strumming, a yeah. little bit of light strumming, and maybe like a little. Yeah, like in the between. chords, it sounds like there's kind of like more of a strumming. Like... Yeah, yeah, I do remember it was pretty gentle. Everything was, even even well, there was, it got a little more intense with the rhythm thing, but it was a pretty quiet. Yeah, and were you using a pick or for your fingers for that? Fingers and pick. So that was Hello, but I also want to go to another song on the same same record and do the song All Night Long. Mm -hmm. Now, this kind of had like, almost like a, like kind of like a an Afro-Caribbean sort of like sound yeah, to it. Yeah. What was the story with, with that song and that session? Well, um, Lionel didn't set it up anyway. You know, we just said, let's start playing. And right away we felt the vibe of what it was. Yeah. Um, and that was a good one because it, it was a long intro and a long, a very extended performance, the whole song. Uh, and that was, we just started playing it. Yeah. You know, and again, like all the stuff we, everybody plays it the first time you play the song and you just kind of psych out what's happening and then yeah. refine parts and kind of get an idea of where yeah. you're going to do what and so forth. And that's what happened. We just ended up playing it that way. And do you think the intent was always for it to kind of have like it has like kind of like all these like congas and like oh, kind yeah. of stuff like that? And yeah. you know, the was there like an intent to go or like do you know anything of, about sort of the, the like what was the the reason for that song? Was it just to kind of make something that had that vibe or I think so. Yeah. I don't know much of the backstory about okay. it. Um uh but he definitely he, he went into a dialogue yeah. coach to get the uh, syllables right that he was saying. So Yeah. Forth. Um, yeah, I don't know too much other than that. And so, w what was like the what was that session like? Did he have you know standard charts? Was he playing the the piano? Yep. Or he, was, he always played. And, and again, it was chord symbols, yep. you know, chord charts. And I remember uh, in the beginning, I'll do some volume thing here. There, there was it was a very ethereal kind of the beginning with the little yeah congas and different things. And I think I was doing some of the. Some of those kind of, yeah, in the context of the, you know, the whole space thing, and then it started into the groove, uh, da, 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 and and I remember. Let's see, that was in eight flat. 
I, I think I, I think the first guitar in the rhythmic entrance was like that kind of thing, kind of a muted yep. thing like that. And then uh, then there was one section. Uh, 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 the a, I guess it would be the A section where I remember I had the chorus going and I first, I just came up with some, doing something for just a, a pad kind of thing. Then it went to the all night long. Yeah. You know, and that was like just using the thumb because you can't yeah. really soften it up with a pick as well. Right. So it was just... Yeah. It was like that. And so there's like the break that goes all night long and then, and then, do you remember the guitar almost sounded like it was kind of doing like a, like, like single note kind of like rhythm guitar stuff in there? Yeah, yeah. Let's see. I think I was getting a little yeah. loose with some of those kind of things. Yeah. But again, not making a point of drawing attention to it. Yeah. Right? As much as making it a, an element of the track. You know? Yeah. It's 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 such a uh, like a master class and like just beautiful rhythm playing because even in the even in that part where like the intro where you're doing the swells, there's also like a thing that I could hear where it's almost like you're doing like a minor nine hammer on. Oh that yeah. Kind of like comes yeah, in yeah, and yeah. out. What's that? One of those yeah. kind of things. Yeah. Yeah, right, right. I do remember that now. Yeah. <laughs> it's a minute ago. Um, yeah, I mean, I make you yeah. recall something that's like, uh, you know, 40 years old almost, you know, yeah, in this case. I know. And, <laughs> and so I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry because I just love hearing these stories. About... No, it's cool. Yeah, it's, it's fun. So, and, and that was also this guitar? That was this guitar, yeah. this I used this electric on the whole record. I don't think I used my 335 on any of that stuff. And was it also likely the same Rivera amps that you... Yeah, uh, that would have been the same era um, setup that I was using. Were you typically running both the amps at the same time? Was it stereo? Yeah. Was it mono? Oh, really? Okay. I would run out of uh, uh, either the board or... I may have at that time had a small rack that I had built and I would just run left and right out of that into the two amps and dial them in that way. Did you ever have producers or anybody like be irritated with the stereo setup or were they always accommodating? No, um, but I would always accommodate if they said, well, we don't want to go stereo. Yeah. Okay, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hired out, you know. I'm, right. And I'll, I'll do, you know, the best I can do, but it's their gig, and so, mm -hmm. you know, I wouldn't say, no, no, we have to do this. Right. You know, I would, I would kind of, try to push ideas that I had to a certain extent. But yeah. again, you know, I would defer to the people yeah. that want to do it. And do you think that that was also the the boss CE1, the big box chorus on that? Right? Yeah. Yeah. It would have been that and uh, the Rivera amps and maybe just that. Do you think any compression on any of that stuff? Probably not. Okay. You know, I, I, I tend to think that it I wasn't using the compressor a lot in those days. Okay. You know, it's funny. Oftentimes I'll, I use some compression and, and it, it's good and then I'll dial it in and yeah, that's good. And then I, yeah. maybe, and then it sounds best when it's not in the surf. Yeah. So it's okay. And yeah. Sometimes that happens, but you know, it's appropriate when it is. Yeah. All right. So that was three huge Lionel Richie hits. And, and again, I, I just can't uh, appreciate you enough, Tim, for the, the beautiful work that you did there. I'm just, uh, I, I'm just so in awe of, the tones, the just the tasteful guitar playing that's on all that, all the beautiful fills. And again, I, I think other than you and Carlos Rios, there was really nobody that they were calling to do those records. And so there must have just been something incredibly special about what you brought to the table for Lionel, well, where it's just like session after session after session, album after album. He's still calling on the great Tim May to yeah. to play the the guitar. Thank you. It's, I'd like to think so, but you know, <laughs> maybe I was available. <laughs> what do you think? You know, like d just to finish on on Lionel Richie. What do you think was like the X factor that he really saw in what it is that you brought to the table that kept on having him call you back? Boy, you know what? I don't know. You know, it's. I hope you know. I hopefully he just thought I did a good job and yeah. and, and did what he needed, and that's. That's the bottom line. That's, that's the best thing. I mean, I don't think there's no other reason <laughs> to have a player there or not. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah, it just worked. And it worked nice, you know. Um, obviously, I'm not the only guy that could have played those sessions. There's, you know, a lot of great players. 
And it was just it was a nice thing. We all got along real good too. Yeah. And they, I got you know the rest of the guys in the band and I always played together for years. So yeah, it was just a nice, uh, comfortable feeling. You know, and I was glad to be there with the with that kind of quality of playing and production. Yeah. And it must have felt so cool when you heard those records on the radio and you're like, I yeah. played that part. That's, that was kind of fun. When I first started hearing things on the radio, I thought, wow, that's pretty neat. Yeah. Because I always thought something I always just would kind of led me into the studio guitar scene. Is it always intrigued me about the anonymity of players yeah. that, wow, there's a guy sitting at the bus stop and he played this, you know. It's, yeah. I don't know, it was just kind of cool. I like the, the yeah. low profile thing about it. And my other favorite thing about playing sessions was that We'd work on a tune, uh, you know, maybe 10 minutes, maybe three hours, maybe a few different sessions. But then when you you got it done, it's like, okay, don't ever play that anymore. Yeah. You know, I love the next, to go on and play the same stuff over again is not my favorite yeah. idea. You know, well, I, you never thought you'd be sitting here and having to replay this stuff I know. 40 years later. That's right. I would have written it down. <laughs> <if> I, <laughs> and uh, the last thing, and, I, and I'm sorry to keep bugging about Lionel Richie, it's just, it's very exciting to me because I, I really love these songs, it, like, did you have a sense that these were going to be huge hits when you were playing them? I and mean, was there already sort of like, uh, like when you're hearing it come together, like, oh yeah, this is going to be, you know, big, or was there not that vibe at the time? Uh, you know, I think any time we did any record or any kind of thing, we'd hoped it would be a big hit, but it wasn't a priority. I never thought about too much of it. Uh -huh. I think because, you know, when you went into a session, I, the whole focus was to do what you need to do now and Everything else was kind of peripheral. Didn't right. really, I didn't think about. Well, this will be that, or if, if I do this, that'll mm -hmm. happen. You know, you, you kind of have to focus on. What so there was no happen. like pressure on you to like we need to manufacture a hit in you know. Well, there's always that implied. You know, no, <laughs> anybody goes into a project, they go, well, we want this to be big. You know, and there's a, you know then there's also every musician has the personal pride of you want yeah. to go in there and you want to yeah. play good, even if yeah. it never sees the light of day. You yeah, know? it's just a musician thing. Yeah, know? I hear that. Well, speaking of things that did see the light of day uh this is one of the coolest stories i think about about your guitar work uh is the movie back to the future obviously right. was a huge hit 1985 and there was some amazing music on there uh huey lewis had a, a big hit that was on the, right. the soundtrack for that this is in the days where soundtracks mattered right, right but one of the most important scenes in the entire movie is at the end when michael j fox uh, marty sure. mcfly has a uh was it an es355 that he's 40, playing? 45 45 yeah. that he's playing the red one yeah and he's playing the song johnny be good right. to this group of of uh, high school students at like a prom or something right. like that right? right that 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 sort of is 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 a, a decade later than what you know the music is that they had available to them at the time yeah and it turns out it's not uh <laughs> michael j fox that was playing that it was actually you playing johnny be good yeah it was me <laughs> and on this very guitar this was the guitar and the reason I chose this guitar, because uh, I had my choice of my Les Paul or my 335, is the direction I was given was, okay, we want to go in this performance uh, from Chuck Berry, 50s style, to the current, which was like Van Halen and that yeah. sort of thing. And all we want to encompass the guitar, history of the guitar from there to there. Okay, <laughs> so, you know, we just played a few takes and... and uh, I just did whatever I did, uh -huh. and it seemed to work. But I, I chose this because I had the, the I was doing the hammer ons and the yeah, because uh, you you do like a, almost like an eruption type like tapping thing. Yeah, at the end. yeah, yeah. Whole, and I needed the 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 uh, Floyd for that. You know, yeah, Floyd Rose, and it worked out good. It was it, you know it, it covered all the bases for me. Do you remember how you were pitched the idea of doing this? Well, we were on the date, and I think we did another couple. Uh, a couple tunes that they, they used in that scene, that particular scene, uh -huh. maybe Night Train, I think we played, and some other tunes, you know, Chuck DeMonaco was playing. And, uh -huh. um, maybe uh, Mike Lang may have been playing piano. I forgot who else was playing. Uh -huh. But we did a few tunes, and, and then they They were more like standards, or...? Well, I think I think we did... Oh, um, Earth Angel was uh -huh. one of them. Remember, he played that. Yeah, because it was sort of like music that was that was supposed to be concurrent uh, for, or for, for the time of, of when this, this right. school dance was taking place in that scene. That's and, right, and they were playing. I think that was what the scene we were working on primarily that day. Uh -huh. And then they said, okay, this is this one, and we got to do... Uh, there was a funny story about that, though, because... We we played the the track and and all that stuff and and uh, you know I did whatever I did and you know all that and then uh, you know went home and, and my wife said oh there's you got a call from a, a new guitar player 
uh, in town who would like to, you know, see, see a session, go on a session with him. I said, yeah, sure. So, you know, I looked at my book and I said, oh, here's another Back to the Future date coming up. That should be guitar heavy. Again, this will be a good one for him to watch. Mark Carter was his name. He's uh -huh. a good guitar player. lives in Orange County, I think. Anyway, so he showed up at this session. It was at Group 4 Studios. Uh -huh. And I remember it was just me overdubbing. I, I didn't know what it was going to be. I walked uh -huh. in and it was just me and the guitar set up. And he's sitting there all excited. And uh, they go, okay, Tim, uh, here's what we need to do. Do you remember the scene in the movie where he plugged in that amplifier? Yeah. And he had the guitar and it was, you hear the thing. And yeah. He, <laughs> he plays that yeah. big power chord. Yeah. That was the scene they were working on. <laughs> so, so, so they're going, okay, now, first thing you need to do is take out your guitar cord and go bzz, 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 with, the, with the thing. Okay, because they were making all the ambient sounds right. of that scene where they're <laughs> plugging the So I'm going, bzz, 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 and okay, now it's, it's just noise of the amp. Now, uh, bang the reverb, you know, so it's like those kind of, and just all ambient sounds. And this guy, Marcus, and they're going, <laughs> Big time studio stuff. Huh? <laughs> He's going. What am I doing? And we we joke. I know him. We joked about that since then. But uh, that was that scene. It was yeah. kind of. I'm, I'm a, well, you know, there's usually much more we have to do, and you have to actually play. So. <laughs> He's like, ah, I'm going home. But anyway, that was kind of interesting. And <laughs> and was it the was it the music or or the, uh, the the movie studio that contacted you to say like hey we need a guitar player that can that can not only do like these jazz standards but can also do oh, you no. know Van Halen stuff or like cause, right because usually there wouldn't be much crossover the guy that's going to be playing Earth Angel is not usually the guy that's going to be tapping right that's right <laughs> well no I mean we were we were contracted there was uh, Alan Silvestri was doing the music for that and uh -huh. we had worked already several sessions on the rest of the the score. And this was another thing. So it was the contractor, I, I believe it was Sandy de Crescent, called and said, hey, we're doing another date. And, you know, she just, you know, the guys were called that, that do that, you know. And, and most of the players were, you know, all the players were versatile enough to do whatever they needed. So it wasn't like, yeah. you know, they didn't specifically pinpoint a guitar style that they needed. Yeah. They just needed a guitar player that could do whatever they needed. So, yeah. So that's how I was, you know. Um, that's how that worked. Just you were the there. guy, and and uh, so this was the guitar. This was it. And what was the amp? Because obviously you needed something that had a little gain. Those, I think, those must have been. If I, because I remember pounding on them. That was uh, that was the Fender, the Blackface '80s vintage. Uh, uh, like, like the Rolex. like the okay yeah, okay. And, the, and these are the Rivera era ones. No, this was a little after that. But Paul, I'm sure, did some tweaking on those amps. Okay, but they were the Fender. Uh, I think it was called the Vibrolux. Okay. And a deluxe. I had two of them. Okay. You know, and those are probably the same amps there. So they were just kind of contemporary for that time, for the eight, in mid-80s. Yeah, Fender yeah. made a run of those amps with the Blackface around that early 80s. I yeah, think. they had the concerts. That's right. Yeah. I, I think one of them was a concert. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Very cool. Well, uh, would you mind playing a little bit of kind of what you did on I'll try. Uh, Johnny Be Good? Yeah, I'll try. All right. <laughs> That's incredible. That's it's such a uh -huh. it's such a great and memorable song. Like that scene is you know it's sort of the you know just like the crescendo of everything that's going on. Yeah. And as as a as a kid watching the Back to the Future series, like you know being a fan of guitar, it's like that's the best scene in in the whole thing. And I that's absolutely good. no idea. I was you know just as a kid, like oh, okay, Michael J. Fox, so multi talented. Yeah. This is sort of perfect timing because we did break a string, but we got the the take. And okay. uh, I think that what I want to do is move to not only a different guitar be, because we are going to need a different guitar, but also because for the next couple of sessions that I want to talk to you about are all based in the semi hollow body 335. Right. And uh, so let's change guitars and give a little suspense to our audience to see what those songs might be. Okay. All right, Tim. So. We've changed guitars. We now have your beautiful 1961 ES 335 yeah. electric Spanish. Electric Spanish, yeah. as <laughs> as as uh, many of us know. Uh, and we're gonna go into your beautiful guitar work with Eddie Rabbit. Mm -hmm. Now, this is something that actually I had learned about a couple of years ago that just showed up to me uh, in a Spotify playlist. And I thought, oh, this is like a really cool kind of vibey like sound that this guy has. Like it's 
It's got some really cool grooves. I had no idea who he was or that he was even a thing back in the, the late 70s and early 80s, but he had some great songs, one of which was the song Suspicions yeah. that you played on. Loved it, yeah. And uh, this was the guitar that was used? Yep. And do you have a sense of what was uh, like the the other gear components of it? It's kind of got this really nice, like vibey, clean tone, really cool kind of like drum t drum sound, really cool kind of bass and just... yeah. Um, well, let's see. I remember I was in the booth and running out. I'm, that rig may have been uh, at the time I was using a big Marshall head uh -huh. and a little twelve inch speaker with that and the usual array of pedals and stuff so this may have been that marshall head uh you know? was it like a, a jmp or a jcm 800 if it were a uh, probably the jmp it was possibly a jmp i can't remember what was it, it was 100 like. or a 50 or do you remember it was 100 it was a big head okay and uh, was it a four input or was it a two input two input okay yeah I'm not mistaken yeah okay yeah that, those are those are still great amps good amps yeah and and you can actually get some pretty good kind of glassy clean tones out of them uh you can if, get a great but the marshall's always had a real organic sound to me a really yeah. natural sound i don't know what how to describe it better than that but they're oh i've got one of those little little tiny mp whatever 15 with yeah. a little effect and the stupid thing sounds really good yeah i mean it's just it's just got a good sound yeah you know? And and was and there was that Paul Rivera pedal board that you were using on that one, um, or was that predated? Was it seventy nine? No, no, that would have been the Paul Rivera okay. pedal board. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Okay. And was there? It sounded like maybe there was some chorus and some processing on there. What kind of stuff were you using? I may have may have used a little bit of chorus. There was a lot of chorus going on in those days. Um, it may have been the Roland. Yeah. Yeah. I had another uh, couple of choruses in the rack. They used to use the delay units. Probably not in 79, though, you think? You had a rack back then? Uh, well, let's see. When did I have? No, maybe not. No. Yeah. I'm sorry, you're right. Yeah, that was... Is that the year this was? was yeah, it was 70. Oh, okay. I mean, the, the record yeah. came out in 79, but probably okay, you might have recorded yeah. it. I mean, there used to be more of a gap between, like, the sessions and the, and yeah, the yeah, release yeah, back yeah, right, then, right? right. Um, well, yeah, in that case, it would have been... Uh, well, then it wasn't the Marshall, probably. Then it was probably the, um, oh, gosh, Fender... Paul Rivera Princeton's maybe oh like so it was just like a, like one of the like the like either silver face or like the mid sixties yeah. yeah yeah and it was just modded yeah. with all of his kind of stage yeah. mods that he would do Paul put his hands on most of my amps ironically the the amp that we've been using the whole time today for both the clean and the dirty is the newest Paul Rivera Stage Four which yeah. is basically an incarnation of his modded Fender platforms with all yeah. of the specialty right. uh, mods effects loops push pulls and all that stuff it's a great sounding amp. Yeah. Um, I, that's. That, do you remember anything specific about the the session? Like how you got the call for it? Was Eddie there? Like right. any of the production uh, things? I, I do remember that date. Uh, it was just me overdubbing. I went and overdubbed the track, and I don't think Eddie was there. If if I remember, I think it was at Westlake Studio, maybe the C, the small room. And um, gosh, you know, I honestly don't remember who was there. It must have been the producer. Yeah. Um, but it was just I was the only player, and it was it was an interesting day because it was you know I had the freedom to right away do whatever yep. you know okay what do you think so he's start playing some stuff and and I first I came up with that little uh, the muted uh, part in the. Which you know was a pretty subtle little thing, but it worked good at the track and that whole little, little sneaky kind of vibe that they had, and uh, and now I did some of the. Uh, we opened up some of those little lines that that you know became a part of the thing, and then with the chorus, the um, I I was having I I tried some different thing and again, you know there's four thousand ways to approach any piece of music. So I was—I remember I was trying something, and yeah, that didn't go over so good. And uh, nobody seemed to be happy with what I was trying to do. And I tried a few different things. So you start digging into your bag of tricks, and and just you know you don't even—I don't even put too much thought into. I guess I do to an extent, but it's like, do you want to, what naturally feels good? Because if you start overanalyzing it, for me, it doesn't—it takes longer. It doesn't doesn't achieve the goal of the best musical mm -hmm. part. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so we i was fooling around and. Then I was just about ready to say, well, I don't know if we need anything there. And then I just came in with that. That 
that little thing, and it just really worked around the lyric and everything like that. I believe the lyric was on there when I did that track. Yeah, how sparse was it when you were playing your your parts? Was there drum and bass or? Oh yeah, I think it was pretty complete with. And the, there's also like a, it sounds like a Rhodes or something like that yeah. is also on there. Yeah, that, I, I'm pretty sure that was all there. The bass, the the. It's a great groove. Really, it's a really great. It's a great groove. groove. Yeah, I, mean, I love the the piece, and it was fun. And I was glad I did that little thing, and that really became. Like, you know, you try this, no, 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 then boom, yeah, and, and everybody loved it. And it's just, that's what you want all the time when you go to work. Do you remember hearing that on the radio for the first time? Being like, oh, yeah. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, you know, I feel like maybe we don't hear about it so much now because it kind of didn't come out during the Spotify, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. like, you know, kind of releases. But, you know, so sometimes when you look, uh, you know, at least when I've looked at sort of like, you know, the playability of, of a song that's maybe from the 70s or even the 60s, like, they don't, even compare with stuff, the music that's released now in yeah. terms of the numbers, just because that's not how it was consumed at that time. But that that's was right. like big hit, like back at that time. It was big. And yeah. uh, I would, I would love to hear. We actually have the track for this. Okay. Oh, and I would love it if you would be willing to kind of play through the the different sections of yeah, it in yeah, your yeah. parts. Would you? I'll be, do what I can. Do sure. you, okay, right, let's do it. <laughs> Yeah, the parts seem to just work well with the track, and you know, again, every every musician wants to go in there and you, okay, play something, play. Wow, that's the best thing we ever heard. But you know, that that took a minute to try different things and get the, the produce, producer to and the artist and whoever, whomever is making the decisions to to love it. You know, and that's what you always want. Man, it's it's uh, yeah. I mean, you, you nailed it masterfully. You know, <laughs> it's uh, and again, you know, that's seventy nine. Yeah. You know, so again, we're talking well over forty years yeah. here between presumably the last. I mean, you never like toured this song or anything like that. Did well, you? I was just about four years old when I did that. You know, yeah, so. right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this guitar sounds incredible. This is a good one. This yeah. Is, so, what's yeah, the story with this guitar? Well, this guitar I got when I was living in Cleveland and playing a lot of cover bands and stuff like that, and. Uh, I just found it at a store, wanted a 335. Couldn't afford the new one. Mm -hmm. This must have been in about 72 or something like that. Thank God 70. you didn't get a new one. I know. <laughs> and they said, well, <laughs> we got real this, dogs this one. at that point. Oh, man. And it just, it lucked out. It's one of those really great guitars. John Crothers did a, you know, he put his hands on it and we find it. has got the, the humbucker. I think I was, had one of the humbuckers replaced because it was getting a little yeah. funky somehow. But it's all the PAFs, and uh, he put new tuners on for me. And so you have like the Grovers, and then you added the the toggle switch. Right. This is this switch is a pickup splitter, and it'll split both pickups at once. And it's just it just. Can I play it? I'll show yeah, you. yeah, sure. Like, yeah. That's really good. And then just takes a little bit of that medium low mid out of it. And the reason that becomes so useful for me is that sometimes in the track. You know, you can sit down and play. I've, I've done this before. You play the guitar. That, that's a great sound. It sounds good. And then you put it in the context of a track, and it's just not as perfect as it should be. So this is one of those things that just thins it out. It just makes it fit in the track. I, technically, I don't know what it does harmonically, but it mm. it just makes it fit in the track better. It's yeah. a very useful little thing. 
Although I put about a thirty thousand dollar hole in this guitar, right? <laughs> but it sounds great, right? Well, no matter what, if you paid you know one hundred and fifty bucks yeah, or two hundred bucks yeah. for this thing, yeah, you, you, yeah, you, you definitely <laughs> will come out ahead. Plus, I got my I got my money's worth out of the guitar. I used it a million times. Yeah. Well, I want to go to another song that used this guitar. Okay. As we've already spoken about a little bit offline. Uh, which is the great Herb Alpert's song, Rise. Rise, yeah. Now, the ironic thing about Rise is that it's probably gotten equal, if not more, play in its sampled version by the the late, great, notorious B.I.G. in the yeah. song Hypnotize, where your guitar part is just looped in that kind yeah. of echoing... I have know. to say, I played all the rhythm stuff on that. That guitar part was played by uh, Chris Pinnock. That, that. Was with Chicago. He, he did that, that that echoplex so he just added that, that in yeah that was an overdub he that was that an overdub and uh, yeah th I, I wasn't there when he did it but but that was done so all the other guitar parts were you but that that's part right. was not you that's right and it was an echoplex I, I imagine uh, some sort of echo thing he did obviously with you know th with that piece do you remember what year that you it was that you recorded that well do we know what year it must it is have been about 79 70 so around the time of the Eddie Rabbit yeah yeah around the same era do we do we have a date um, on 79 70? yeah that sounds right so I would have been using the same pedal board Paul yeah. in fact no I specifically remember that that was at a m studios we did those okay and I remember using that because I I used the octave uh divider the, yeah and then I think maybe the mutron and the biphase I had the yeah great deep biphase thing and uh yeah that, and that the modded a, Paul Rivera amp I'm the, sure those in the fender amps. modded and, yeah. and were you using, uh, uh, you know, obviously he would mod whatever you brought him, but do you remember if it was a Vibrolux, a Deluxe, a Princeton? I had a Princeton and a Deluxe. Okay. Um, Did it have those, like, concentric knobs that you would see on on uh, some of, the, like, the Steve Lukather one had, like, this kind of funny concentric lo uh, knob that almost looked like a like a master combo lock that you'd put on, like, your high school locker? Oh, kind yeah. Of. Well, yeah, it had a little round gray thing, and it was, a, like, a fat switch. Okay. Yeah, that, and I think I had some push pull things in there too to to get different filters going. Yeah, but Paul, boy, he he did it. Yeah, he I mean, he was he's the guy, and 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 you know, he, God bless him. He, he brought us an amp today for yeah. us to use. I so might he, walk out with that today. Yeah, it's a great sounding amp. Don't tell him. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so on Herb session, you had that stuff. Do you remember anything you know remarkable about the session? How much of it was written out? Like, what was the session like? Uh, well, that was again. It was Abe Laboreal and Mike Lang, great yeah. pianist. Uh, Steve Schaefer, I think, and just the four of us on the tracking there, and uh, Herb, of course. Uh, we no, it was the I'm, if I remember right, and I'm pretty sure I do. It was just chord charts again. Yeah, just, just you know, make up some stuff, guys. Here we go. Yeah, and uh, we just started playing it. Yeah, and then play it again. Try, try this. And everybody's learning their parts and doing different yeah. things. You know. And it was nice. There was a lot of just groove vamp stuff. Yeah, I mean, you know? it's an incredible groove. I mean, one of the, obviously, like, you know, one of the best of all time. And I think, you know, as I said, it's been kept alive through hip hop oh, and, right. it, and, it's, and it's sampling. Uh, I would love to, if you're willing to play through some of that, I got some of the track. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, maybe you could play through some of your parts. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> I remember I played a couple of different kinds of things. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 
something like that. It's such Anything? a great part. It's yeah, such it's kind of cool. So, uh, what? The, I mean, the voicings of this are are a little are a little tricky. What are what are the the chord voicings that you're doing on that? Well, on that I'm one? just doing the standard. Uh, in, in in this, it's a uh, just F minor seventh chord. Uh -huh. And uh, I'm, but I'm, what I'm doing is I'm doing a little half step, a little slide, then the D D flat major seventh. The same thing. The only tricky part is getting getting that kind of smooth sound. That kind of thing. I'm yeah, just I don't know something to come up with. <laughs> and so like that wasn't something that was dictated by her. No, music. no, no. It was just like here's the chord chart. You're gonna embellish it in whatever ways that you exactly. Right. Okay. We just got F minor. You know. And do you remember, like, was that like a super long session, or was it kind of just like, you, like, with the whole band just did a couple of takes, or? You know, boy, you know, I th we did. It was a whole day, I think, working on that tune, perhaps, and you know, we probably went a few hours. But I think, I think, her recorded that tune with a couple, few different bands, um, some different guys, maybe, maybe one or two different times. Anyway, mm -hmm. and. Whatever, this is the version he ended up liking with. Interesting. So he kind of pulled a little bit of a Steely Dan where he had like a musical chairs. Of, I think he did. <laughs> I think he did, yeah. But I remember we worked, yeah, I don't think, Herb took his time. I think yeah. we spent most of the day on this tune. Yeah. It was that all neck pickup or what was that? This is, actually I'm splitting the pickups. I'm using both of them. Uh -huh. And uh, I have them out of the, the pickup split. So, so it's a little thinner. Just a little, little cubbier sound. And do you think that that's likely what you had on the original record? I, I think I did. You know, again, it's hard to remember. But you had that mod done. But... Yeah, early on, I did the mod pretty early. Yeah, I'm sure I had that splitter in there. Okay, yeah. that's really cool. That's awesome. Well, man, what a what a cool sound and like you know the the voicings of those chords is just it's such a perfect fit, such a great groove, and you know, un yeah, understandably, so. it's it's why it was such a huge song. When it originally came out, and also in its in its sampling nature, hopefully, uh, you know, her, her was still getting a, a, a good paycheck for the sample. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but man, like, kind of cool that it it it, uh, it continues to memorialize the, through through uh, just a, a total different group of fans who probably don't know that that's the origins yeah. of it. But and who thought at the time? Playing. Yeah, when we were doing it, you know, that that would be the thing. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, seventy nine embryonic stages of of hip hop, um, yeah. you know, at least in a commercial sense, and uh, you know how how big it's became as a genre. But uh, man, I want to I want to talk about one more group that you worked with that mm -hmm. I think was pivotal in your in your career, uh, where you might have also used this guitar. Uh, is with the the great Pointer Sisters. Oh yeah, and uh, they of course have had uh, an amazing career, plenty of hits, yeah. and uh, some of their biggest records they called none other than the great Tim May to uh, put down some guitar. What can you tell me in general just about working with the Pointer Sisters, your experience and uh, in, in in those sessions? Oh, it was great. Richard Perry produced those records. Okay, we did those at Studio Fifty Five. And it was it was always nice. It was it was just a fun thing. We all of Richard's dates would show up, and the first thing we do is order food from Nicodell's next door, mm -hmm. and eat and relax, and we play. And and uh, point, I don't think the Pointer Sisters were there when we did most of the tracks. Uh -huh. Like Slowhand, for instance, uh, uh, there was the, we did the basic tracks, and I did a lot of overdubs on that, uh -huh. where it was just me in addition to that. Um, as far as I think it may have been Nathan East. Playing. I'm not sure who else was in that band at the yeah. time. John Barnes was doing a lot of playing at that time. Yeah. Um, I do remember. I do remember at the end of a long day, at the end of the night, we were all packing up, and Nathan was going direct, of course, with his bass, and he's he wanted to redo his part. So he was in the middle of the studio, and he opened up his four-page part of the you know, master rhythm, and we were packing up, and he didn't have to be quiet because he was direct, so. I was saying goodbye. I see you guys, and I walked by Nathan Stanton. And I just lit his music on fire <laughs> on the left side of it while he was playing. So he's playing, and the, he's about a bar and a half before the music is burning. <laughs> and he tore it up, though. He did. It, it didn't matter. Yeah, that was just a little 
Maybe, well, maybe give him a little extra incentive, you know, just to... Just yeah, to <laughs> don't mess it up, because this is it. The music is burning. That's right, everybody. Well, and he, I, I guess at, at the, you know, the Pointer Sisters, this would have been probably in the 80s, right? Mm -hmm. the, the early part of the 80s for some of these Pointer Sisters records. I would think, yeah. Records. yeah. Uh, so Nathan would have been pretty young. He would have been, you know, yeah. probably in his 20s. Well, yeah, we were all young. Nathan yeah. was, uh, he's just a couple years younger than me, I think. Okay. But, uh, yeah, we were we were young punks. Yeah. All of us. <laughs> so uh, I think maybe we we start with uh, Slow Hand and, mm -hmm. uh, and and you know obviously a huge hit for them and there's some really cool guitar stuff. I think volume swells too. That's right. We did a lot of those in the beginning. Um, so you're using this guitar, still yeah. the Rivera rig for that? Or? Same rig, I would think. Yeah, same couple. Yeah, this was that same era. You have any sense of whether again it was Princeton most likely or same amps? Probably that that concert and okay. the. Uh, the uh, Princeton or Deluxe. Okay. Those two. Okay. And, and the Rivera pedal board. Yeah. yeah and mm -hmm. and uh, do you remember what kind of volume pedal you're using? There wasn't so many choices back then. There was like the Show Bud. I think it was a Show Bud. Yeah. That's most likely what it had. <laughs> yeah. That's the biggest one. volume pedal you've ever seen. Big, yeah. Yeah. And then you have to fix that string every once in a while. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, so would you be willing to maybe play through some of the your 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 parts and and just kind of show us maybe how how you approached it and how yeah. you yeah well I, for the first part that I played um, the the basic rhythm part was a lot of just. Uh Just some low chugging fifths like that. Pretty fundamental part. Yeah, in the beginning, I remember doing some of the volume pedal things. Like some of that kind of thing. Those kinds of things. There's nothing, you know. That kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, pretty simple. And it was, again, it wasn't a part. It was just some fills that we were, we were yeah. overdubbing. So that, so that came in afterwards, that sort of stuff. That was an overdub. So more, the, the, more like the fifth stuff and kind of the chugging thing, that was kind of more what you would have done during the actual like, That's tracking. Right. Okay. That's right. It was a lot of that. Yeah, there, there's such great parts. I, I also really want to hear about uh, He's So Shy. Right, um, right, you know, because it starts, you know, the guitar sounds like it's kind of buried a little bit. I think the introduction, I don't know if it has any guitar or not, or at least I can't really tell if I can hear it. Or well, not. what what most of the part was, it was mostly that kind of backbeat kind of thing, and then it's almost was, like an old school kind of like almost like a Motown approach to something. You yeah, know, yeah, it was just uh, that was. I think Rich, uh, Richard Perry told me. Yeah, we did that track with the rhythm section, and then he redid some parts and stuff, and he said the only part that they kept was that backbeat part yeah. from the original session, uh -huh. which was interesting, but uh, it was not, you know, it wasn't such a ridiculous part, but it just fit right with the whole thing. And then there was that one part of the tune, uh, um, I forgot what the key it was in, but it was like... Uh, it's just a little thing, everybody kind of hit that little thing. Uh -huh. In the chart, it was all, again, chord symbols. But there would be little little um, items from throughout the piece that might be just a little thing. Everybody plays unison. Uh -huh. It's that, that kind of thing, you know? Yeah. And then, of course, there was the old... Uh, that's yeah. make it through the track, that harmonic. Uh, yeah, because there, there's sort of like, it sounds like there's like a synthesizer that's kind of doing like a like an arpeggio. Yeah, kind of, yeah, it kind of goes ascends and then descends a little bit. Uh, and then it sounds like the guitar might like almost uh, doubles that in a way. I don't know if that, if, if that, if you remember it that way. It's no, kind of buried in there, so I don't know if I'm hearing yeah. things. Oh, you know what? Yeah, I kind of think I do remember. Um, there's a little unison. That's right. You know yeah. what? I, I forgot about that. They did write some little, again, like I'm saying, little snippets where everybody was playing the unison part, that sort of thing. And yeah, that was with the uh, the clavinet. I think was playing whatever that was at the time. Um, but yeah, it was it was. They built the track, you know, that way. But it was it was a. That's a good song, you know. Yeah, it's an amazing song, and it's it's sparse, but the the yeah. rhythm guitar part is is important for kind of again like the glue. That holds the song together. Yeah, it was one of those classic backbeat parts, you know. Do you it, do you remember where that one was recorded? Studio Fifty Five. Okay, yeah. so both of them. Richard Perry. Okay. Yeah, that was his room. 
Okay. Uh, yeah. And, I mean, and as you said, the Pointer Sisters were not there for any of those recordings. You, you know, um, I think they were there some of the time, actually. Now that I'm thinking about it, uh, not all the time. They would maybe sing with some of the tracks uh -huh. with us. And Live. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, they were there part of the time, not uh -huh. all the time. And did they have a lot of input as far as, like, guitar parts, or were you mostly just... Uh, no, not so much. They might say, they might um, come up with a suggestion for any of the, the players, probably through Richard, mm -hmm. saying, uh, no, she, uh, Ruth or June or something, you might say, Richard, I need something here to do it, and, and Richard might, okay, piano player, do this, or, you yeah. know, it would be kind of through them. Were, the pointers and the sisters barely came up to me, and you know, or anybody said, were play. they musicians, or were they just primarily, oh, yeah. they were... Well, you know, I'm, I'm assuming. I don't mm -hmm. really know. I never I never really got to know much about their musical. Uh, if they played that way, but they sure sang, right? And, oh, yeah, they, you know, yeah, undoubtedly. I, I think, I'm, I'm, I would guess that they're very schooled. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a classic, classic song. I mean, both of those are just incredible hits. And, yeah, they were good songs. And among many that they continue to have, whether, you know, it was, you know, pre those records or after yeah. they had a lot of great hits, but... I'm one song that's coming to mind that we haven't talked about yet, and I think would be an interesting one to finish on. Would be from American Gigolo, which was the oh. Blondie oh, yes, hit yeah. "Call Me." Right, right. And uh, you know, it's an interesting one because uh, you know I'd looked extensively through your catalog, and you know, as we know, some credits on Discogs and all credits are they're kind of all over the place. And uh, and it, they don't. I, I couldn't find any credit on a guitar player, and so I'm so oh. glad that you had said to me, oh. "I played this part because it's like it's actually like a pretty cool guitar rhythm part." Yeah, it's kind of neat. And of course, the song was hugely successful for Blonde. I mean, arguably one of her biggest hits. Yeah. And I think everybody has heard this song at one point, whether it's you know used in a in a you know popular music or a popular yeah. movie that uh, other than American Gigolo it showed up in other stuff as well yeah. Yeah. Uh, outside of you know Richard Gere. Uh, yeah. But uh, I would love to know about what's a session like with with Blondie. Well, uh, Blondie wasn't there. That was Giorgio Marauder. Oh wow! Song. And that was again at Westlake, and mm -hmm. I remember going in and overdubbing, and. Uh, if I remember right, I was using my Rivera amps. The, the, when, the time he made me an amp head, mm -hmm. just, just his SL, mm -hmm. whatever, SL1 or something like that. And it was a two-channel, beautiful amp. And that's what I was using. I had a small rack made. Rivera that. branded. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was his first rack mount amps he was making, which I still use mm -hmm. in, in, in my rack now. But um, yeah, it was good. It was all overdubbing. And Giorgio was always real fast. He says... Mm -hmm. Okay, do this, and you do it, and yeah, great. Next, and, and it was moving on. Yeah, I mean, he's a he's a legend, even into you know oh, yeah. modern music and influenced you know guys like uh, Daft Punk and stuff like that. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, it was fun. Do you uh, remember much of the part? That well, there was there was a few parts. <laughs> Under the bones there, right? Yeah, and then for the for the chorus, was it mostly just the power chords, or was there also like single notes kind of uh, going in there? Though the chorus had the power chords and the first the other triplet layer we were talking about, but then I, I caught every little bit of the lick. And um, at one point, uh, da 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 da. There was just yeah. that little phrase in there. It's probably that. And then you just think the power chord just came on the back of it, so it kind of sounded like it was like one. Oh, right. Yeah. But he wanted me to hold. Then I went to the, the low power. Yeah. And that was doubled with the synths and stuff like that, yeah. too. So it became a thing, part of the arrangement in there. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's such a, it's, it's a great, it's a really fun rock and roll song to play. But usually when you see... Cover bands, they kind of have to choose a part. They don't get to, you know, unless they have two guitar players, they can't, you know, usually do the whole thing. So most right. people are just relegated to the rhythm part yeah. for the most part. Especially uh, they, with that tune, there's, you know, a bunch of 
you guitar parts going on. So. Yeah. So do you, what do you? Is there like more than three layers? You think? I think there's three. Three layers. Okay. Yeah. 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 I mean, because it sounds so heavy and big. Yes, but we may have doubled. Come to think of it, um, that would was very kind. That is very common too. We probably doubled the power chords. Yeah. So he'd have even more oomph. And it was in this guitar. Yeah. 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 Wow. And bridge position, presumably for this. Yep, yeah. Yeah. Back pickup, full on. Yep. Hitting the amp. Man, is this incredible? And and I, I it doesn't. It sounds pretty dry. So I don't think that there was much in the way of effects. It didn't sound like. No, I think it was just the grunge. Yeah. Just the. That's the crunch great. Sound. Man. And then yeah, then there was that little that lick in there. Yeah. So cool. Oh, and then the other thing, uh, the only other section was that. Da, 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 da. There's that one little that that yeah. part is, is comes out. I forgot where it is in the tune exactly now. Um, yeah, it kind of goes. There's uh, there's almost like a like a synth solo or something. Yeah, that, that yeah. kind of comes in. It kind of like psychedelic. -y. Yeah, That's I think right. it comes yeah. right before that. I, yeah. That kind of little thing in there. Yeah, there's another layer. I don't think there were too many um improvised licks just just random licks throughout there it was mostly parts like yeah. power chords which the, which georgie already kind of had he had in mind what he yeah, wanted yeah okay yeah okay mm -hmm. yeah man so cool and do you remember even how like it, how did how did he get in touch with you or like what was the why well, tim may on that one i was one of the circle of guys that were working you know yeah. and, and there's like you know the rhythm players that were doing the stuff, and you say, "Yeah, get that guy." You know. Do you remember seeing that that movie come out and kind of the, like how big that took off? I mean, yeah, it must have felt yeah. kind of cool, like 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 you know, telling your friends, "Like, hey, yeah, I played on that." Yeah, it's, <laughs> I don't like to say too much about it, but yeah, it's <laughs> it's nice. It's just nice to hear, like, "Oh yeah, that was cool." Sometimes you hear something, "Gee, I didn't like that as much as I thought I would." You know, so whatever it might be. But. Has there been an example of something where where you've heard back like a you know a, a big hit like Lionel Richie or or Blondie and or Blondie and been like? Oh, <laughs> no, I don't think so. Um, it, it's just there's, I'm always, you know, there's always like, gee, I wish I did this or did that or some, you know, other things that you just second guess some stuff yeah. you do. But yeah, I can't complain. It, it yeah, came out pretty good. Yeah, well, ultimately, right, you're working for them, so whatever they decided, there's the best version of it. Yeah, is is yeah. is is uh, it's not up to you in the end, I guess. And it's you know, it's a it's a real good thing. Um, I I I enjoy understanding other people's perspective what they're trying yeah. to do yeah in music regardless of you know if it's a pedestrian simple yeah. kind of thing or not understanding the concept of what they're going for i like it and, yeah. and i usually you know hopefully i usually get it and yeah I go, oh yeah i see what you're doing and you kind of agree yeah. you know it's not too many times where it's like i have no idea what this guy's talking about yeah yeah i hear you on that there's one last thing that i want to do with you that i i've been trying to do with all of our interview guests where i find photos of them <laughs> from the past and i ask them to tell us a little bit about the context now i tried my oh, hardest yeah. to find some with you with hair uh yeah. and, but i couldn't find any <laughs> Got to go way back for those. <laughs> <laughs> but i'm going to show you a couple okay. here that i have and i and i want you to explain what it is that's going on in, <laughs> okay. in, the, in the photo so the first one that i have appears to be a a group of, of very distinguished guitar players oh, yeah. from Lee Rittenauer to Mitch Holder and then of course the great Tim May. Yeah. What's uh what's going on here in this photo? That is the four of us have been friends for years. I met Lee Rittenauer when I was sixteen years old. Wow. And Lee was eighteen and I was at a Howard Roberts guitar seminar in mm -hmm. Los Angeles. I came out and I met Lee. So that many years ago I knew Lee. Mitch I met in uh Tom, I met in 74 when I first moved to L.A. So we had been friends for years. And this was a, one of our, we developed a, a routine, a tradition of having a Christmas dinner at the Lobster in San Monica every year. Uh -huh. So around December, around Christmas time, we would always get together, the four of us, and have, nice. have a dinner and hang out and close the joint. So that's that. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, well, it's that's a cool story that you. So you knew Lee before you ever moved out here. Yeah, yeah. Did he ever help you like land any sessions or anything like that? Yeah, well, you know, Lee was he was here, had been here, and yeah. and, and I moved, and we got to work. He, we worked together a little bit, not a whole lot, but we worked together quite a few dates. And then he did a, an Olivia Newton John special that he was the musical director and hired me and uh, different things like that. Yeah, but we've known and hung and played and went to each other's weddings and all that kind of wow. stuff over the years. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Okay, well, here's another one. Uh, 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 more heavy hitters. So uh, you got George Benson there uh, oh, yeah. with uh, with you. And uh, what's going on in uh, in this photo? That, boy, where'd you get that? That was uh, George. Well, first of all, George 
uh, is a very special uh, person in my life because when I was about 16, I guess, 15, my dad and I went down to hear him play at, at a, a place called the East Town Motor Inn in Cleveland. And he was, so, it was before he was huge, but he was there with the organ trio and just playing ridiculous, as he always did. And we, I, I went there every night, I think. It was a small venue, so we got to know each other a little bit. And he let me actually sit in with him one time late in a little quieter night. And and anyway, since then, I mean, I've worked on his uh, um, the album. Uh, the, well, I did a solo on his last album that's coming out. He had a, a, um, a track from the London Symphony Orchestra. Uh-huh. Like, and, and they rebooted some stuff. We got some stuff. And I put a little nylon string he asked me to do, which I was... Honor to do it. I said, yeah. you do it. You know, yeah. what but anyway, did that, and then we worked on the um, the album, the Nat King Cole tribute album that yeah. he did, and mm-hmm. that was really fun. But he he was just a great guy. He came out. He was here in town for whatever reason, and we just had dinner. Wait, how long ago was this picture taken? You think that must have been? I think it was before COVID, so about maybe three years ago. Okay, like right before. Okay, yeah, that was fun. Awesome. Yeah. All right. So here they got one more, and, and this might be the ultimate in in guitar heavies. Oh, I know. That. Uh, you got Carl Verheyen. You got Paul Jackson. You got yeah. Dean Parks. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I mean, just among you know, just all, all these heavy hitter guitar players, but all holding banjos. Yeah. <laughs> um, what's going on in this photo? Well, that was that was a very interesting call. That we got a movie call from. Uh, um, John Powell, his huh? name is a composer, who's also a violin player, but huh? it was a wonderful composer. And, and George Deering in there too. Mm-hmm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the whole everybody in town was. There. So um, I got the call, like the rest of us did, but we didn't know what else. I got a call. Can you make a? I think it was like two double sessions at Fox for this motion picture. For okay, yeah, great. So I put yes on the call, and then um, the call was it was about two or three weeks ahead of the call. So then the following week or so, they said, oh, it's going to be 12 mandolins. Okay. So, the, you know, I, I was trying to think of 12 guitar players that doubled on mandolin. Yeah, I mean, that, that must be a rare occurrence where you get that many of just like the top session guitar players in the same room. The only time. It's working. You know, yeah. We were all hanging at one yeah. time, but but to be... And the banjo thing was, there was a couple of cues that we all did the same thing on banjos. And they were so. actual banjos. They weren't just like guitar... No, oh, banjos. Okay. Yeah, banjos, yeah. Wow. Wow. We all <laughs> well, man, Tim, I, I just want to thank you again oh, yeah. for My ev- everything that you've done uh, for the musical community, for, for pop music. Well, and uh, the parts that you've created, I think, are, are just uh, indelible. You know, like there's just, there's, they've become such a part of the, just the, the lexicon and the vocabulary that we've come to understand around a lot of these musicians, whether it be Lionel Richie or the Pointer Sisters or yeah. Herb Alpert and this cool connection with Notorious B.I.G. and the song Hypnotize. Yeah, isn't that well? There, there's just all of these these ways that just makes the music come full circle and and you're such a part of that. And I just uh, really uh, thank you for, for uh, all the work that you've done yeah. and, and just so honored that you would allow us to uh, talk with you about just a, a small part of your career. Well, I'm flattered, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate well, it. Uh, Thanks again, and uh, you know, looking forward to uh, connecting at some point da- down the road. I know that we could probably be, be going through songs all day long, and uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Just glad we could narrow it down to a few that we could uh, we could talk about. Yeah, I wish I remembered some of the songs some better that we played. <laughs> well, yeah, it's our thing. It's hard thing to remember them forty <laughs> it was a years later. Ago. <laughs> but yeah, thank you again, and, and thank you for everybody for uh, for watching, and uh, we'll see you on the next one.